Wow, this is a wonderful turnout. Uh, I appreciate you all being here and uh, uh, here to welcome our first speaker of the, of the wonderful Gender Studies Symposium. Um, Rita has a little bit of laryngitis, um, but I'm sure she'll be a great speaker uh, because her thoughts and her analysis are very, very interesting. Um, Rita is a Buddhist feminist theologian and author. She earned her PhD in the history of religions from the University of Chicago. And um, the first thing that she did was a dissertation on uh, the role of women in Aboriginal Australian religion, which, according to something I read, I hope it's true, was one of the, was the perhaps first dissertation ever to bring the disciplines of women's studies and religious studies together. Uh, so perhaps that's true. Uh, it was a groundbreaking dissertation. And kind of bringing this analysis of gender to religious studies has been a hallmark now of Rita's uh, professional and um, I guess you could say activist career ever since. Um, she followed this work with studies of female god language in a Jew Jewish context. And then she became a Tibetan Buddhist. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what led to that transformation, but um, in the mid 1970s, she became a student of Tibetans and uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and she studied with a number of very influential teachers um, over the next few decades. So she's now a senior teacher in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition and brings a very important um, feminist critique, essentially uh, favorable, friendly critique, but critique nevertheless to contemporary Buddhism. Now, um, you may or may not know, but Buddhism is going through something of a, a revival um, a, uh, a wave of popularity in the contemporary American scene. I'm really happy about that as a practitioner of Zen Buddhism. I'm sure uh, Rita is very happy about that as a practitioner of Tibetan Buddhism. But at the same time, um, it's very important to acknowledge that Buddhism, as with many other world religions, has um, a kind of sh more shadowy history of patriarchy and gender inequalities. Um, Rita has been one of the most important voices to bring that history to light and to really get people thinking about how to overcome the gender inequalities that, that do exist within basically all forms of Buddhism. Um, she's one of the most uh, powerful analysts of this uh, problem, I think you could say, and also one of the most inspiring. An example of this it just came to me yesterday. I checked my email and I got this email from somebody on campus um, who who said essentially the following. She wrote the following in her email. I saw that Rita will be speaking uh, at the Gender Studies Symposium. I spent five years living in a Theravadan Buddhist monastery intending to ordain and return to lay life um, after encountering many obstacles to women's ordination and practice. Rita's writing has long been an inspiration and I would love to meet with her. So I hopefully this person got a chance to meet with Rita earlier. I'm not sure if that happened, but it's just one small example of the countless number of people who've uh, read Rita's work and uh, kind of resonated with this desire for a truly egalitarian approach to Buddhism as well as uh, a desire for gender egalitarianism in all religions. So, um, well, with that, I will um, welcome Rita. Let's give her a really warm uh, round of applause and uh, hear what she has to say. Well, thank you. I do indeed have a touch of laryngitis, um, which is a souvenir from having been in India this winter during some very cold weather there, and basically um, meeting outside for a Sakya Dita conference. So I will do my best. I have some cough drops up here. I have water at the ready, and I might have to clear my throat <clears throat> more often than I usually do. Uh, this is actually my second visit to Lewis and Clark. Um, I gave a baccalaureate address here many, many years ago. We figured out the person that was sitting next to me at dinner in the early 90s sometime. And the title of the talk I gave here then, which was Soaring and Settling, became the title of one of my books. So I'm in a certain debt to Lewis and Clark in that way. Um, I've always enjoyed being here. I also came to Portland for another event some years ago, and uh, I find it a very civilized place. I was happy to be able to use public transportation so easily yesterday. It's not something that happens everywhere. <clears throat> so the title of my talk 
uh, is how clinging to gender subverts enlightenment. This is a talk that I normally give to Buddhist audiences, to people who have some real practice with Buddhist meditation and have been studying Buddhist thought for some years. Um, and I, I sort of said, well, I don't know if this is a talk for an audience that's mainly non-Buddhist, but this is what was requested. So we'll do it. We'll do the best we can. Um, but I will think I will have to fill in some blanks somewhere in what I plan to say tonight. I think I should start with my definition of feminism. I have learned over the years that it can be very dangerous to be introduced as a feminist or give a talk on feminism without defining what I mean by it. Because as every other thing that's somewhat controversial, uh, people can bring a lot of their own projections to the talk. And tonight in my talk, one of the most important points I'm going to be making is the way in which people bring their own projections and concepts to the topic of gender. Um, that gender is not anything that exists in the clear and simple way we often think it does. So my definition of feminism has been for many, many years that feminism is freedom from the prison of gender roles. Very simple. Freedom from the prison of gender roles, a definition that applies equally to men and to women. I very much agree with the point that uh, gender studies and feminism, for lack of a better term, is not about any kind of men versus women or women versus men situation. As someone who was socialized before the second wave of feminism began, I was very much socialized in the rigid gender roles of the 19, late 1940s and 1950s. And believe me, it was a prison. It was very much a prison. And that's very much the way I experienced it. I can remember as a child thinking frequently, why did I have to be a girl? Girls don't get to do anything interesting and important. It's just, I just don't, why did I have to be a girl? And then one day, somehow, this was also before the second wave of feminism began, I, somehow I just realized, hey, there's nothing wrong with being a girl. It's the system. It's the system that's flawed. Can't you hear me? <laughs> so that was really a lifesaver. But it didn't, you know, it didn't immediately solve all my problems because I still carried a tremendous amount of anger over, over the injustice of the system. It was totally unacceptable to express that anger. And there was still the prison of gender roles that I had to, uh, had to fight with. Um, when I went to graduate school to study comparative studies in religion, the University of Chicago Divinity School had about 400 women in the student body. Um, there were 12 women among the 400, and six of us had entered that year. The professors were flabbergasted. What are we going to do with all these women who want to study religion all of a sudden? It's just like, what are we going to do? So out of that comes my definition of feminism as freedom from the prison of gender roles. And my talk will be much more on gender than it will be on sexual orientation. I've worked much more on gender issues than I have on issues of sexual orientation, though I obviously see that the two are related. So um, <clears throat> as I said, I normally give this talk to audiences that are re more familiar with Buddhism. And um, so I have to fill in some of the jargon and some of the terminology that is very, very common in Buddhism. I think, first of all, to look at the title. The title has a thesis in it, of course, how clinging to gender subverts enlightenment. Enlightenment is obviously the point of Buddhist practice. It's what Buddhists hope to uncover not manufacture, but uncover, because we say that enlightenment is our birthright, but we have covered it up with a lot of confusion along the way. And uh, as I go through my remarks, various understandings or definitions of enlightenment will become clearer. But clinging to gender 
subverts that enlightenment. And this is something that, that I hold as a very as a very deep problem and a very deep truth that we are all trained to adhere to gender roles, gender norms, gender expectations, gender stereotypes, and it's actually very difficult to really, really break free of them. It's, it's quite a project. But I claim that clinging to gender does subvert enlightenment. Now, the operative word here, as is so often the case with Buddhism, is clinging. Um, clinging is a word that translates um, a Pali Sanskrit word, of course. What it means is really being stuck to something. Um, it means being obsessed with something, being so uh, stuck on something that you can't imagine any other alternative. And that is the way I think many, many people take gender roles, gender norms, gender expectations, and stereotypes. And that clinging to gender subverts enlightenment. Mere recognition of a label like man or woman is not problematic, but clinging to social meanings of that label, that does subvert enlightenment. <clears throat> so clinging is an important word. Another set of words that are really important in what I have to say turn on the terms I'm going to translate as ego and egolessness. Um, in Buddhism, there's a term anatman, which is very difficult to translate, but it's often translated as non-self or egolessness. Uh, and that contrasts, of course, with ego. Now, this is one of the most difficult points of Buddhism. It usually takes a long time for people to truly understand what is being said because we have a very deep-seated belief that we are somebody, that we're somebody very specific. But Buddhism says, well, that's not quite the way it is. Um, the emphasis in teachings on egolessness is that there is no lasting, unchanging, permanent, personal soul or self. No lasting, unchanging, permanent, personal soul or self. That's what egolessness means. It doesn't mean that we don't have um, a common, changing, moment-to-moment -moment identity. It means that there's nothing in that identity that is permanent, unchanging, lasting. I used to uh, kind of bring this home to my students at the university. They would all say that, no, they believed in immortality. They would never believe in egolessness. And so I would say, OK, so if you're going to be immortal, which one of you? Which one of you? And they would be dumbfounded. Like, they never thought about that before, that if you presuppose there's some kind of unchanging personal self, you have to pick out one moment in the changing sequence of your life, and I see somebody's getting it, and focus on, well, this is the me that I want to be at last forever. This one, not that one, not that one, not that one. This particular, this moment, somehow that one's going to be permanent. It's a very odd concept when you think about it, and yet we have been so deeply we have, we have so deeply allowed ourselves to believe in a personal, immortal soul that we find it hard to actually come to terms with egolessness. So ego, by contrast, is the attempt to find or secure this um, non-existent personal self or soul. Ego is the attempt to find or secure this personal, unchanging, permanent self that we think we have. A lot of Buddhist training is simply about saying, OK, that's the way it seems to you, so go find it. If that thing is there in your stream of consciousness somewhere, you should be able to find it. You should be able to locate it. And people look here, people look there. There are, oh, hundreds of exercises that are given to people on, well, look here, look there. Find, capture that personal self. And the students always come up empty-handed. There are some very famous stories about students telling their teacher 
that they were very upset, they were very troubled, their mind or their, their soul was making them very unhappy. And the teacher says, oh, that's not a problem. Just go get your soul, bring it to me, and I'll pacify it for you. Yeah, you're starting to get it better. So the student, after about a day or a week, the student comes back and says, you know, I couldn't find it. No matter where I looked, I couldn't find that enduring permanent self or mind that I thought was giving me so much trouble. I couldn't find it. And the teacher says, problem solved. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Now, I suppose the main thesis of my talk really is that among the dimensions of ego that we cling to most persistently are our concepts about gender, our concepts about what it means to be a man or a woman or to be lesbian or to be gay or for someone else to be man, woman, lesbian, gay, whatever. We have a tremendous number of concepts about what that should mean or must mean that we impose on ourselves and on others. And that's the clinging to gender that subverts enlightenment. Uh, if the terms ego and egolessness uh, seem a little problematic to you, I've been thinking that today uh, we might use the term identity, that we're always c proclaiming our identity. But uh, identity is never completely changing or unchanging or stable. Identity is never completely unchanging or stable. One changes constantly. The only alternative is to be dead. So we probably prefer change to being dead. But change means that we don't have a permanent identity that we can always call up. Nevertheless, as Buddhists have analyzed the human predicament, we want to be or to have an unchanging identity. For some reason, we think that would really be good, uh, to have an unchanging identity. Paradoxically, at the same time as we're always trying to improve, to get richer, to get better, to be more beautiful. Uh, so we cling to our identities and develop a lot of ideologies around identity. And all you have to do is look at politics, and you can see how much people have created identities that they have so much ideology about, to which they cling so desperately, and which cause all, this, all that suffering. <clears throat> now, clinging in Buddhist analysis, I don't think this takes too much deep thinking to figure out, clinging always produces suffering. Clinging is not a pleasant affair. It's a very unpleasant state of mind. And the only reason people put up with it is they think that somehow at the end of the process of clinging, there's going to be satisfaction. But of course, what always happens is that the satisfaction is short-lived. One wants something else. It didn't work out the way we thought it would. So I think that may be enough for now by way of introductory comments on some basics in Buddhism, that uh, clinging is a problem. Clinging produces suffering. Um, I might want to say, by way of translating a few of Buddhist, Buddhism's noble truths, Buddhism does not teach that all life is suffering, as is often mistranslated. It's one of the greatest misunderstandings of Buddhism. What the first noble truth about dukkha, about suffering, says is that if we go about our lives conventionally, habitually, the way we've been taught to by our culture, that will always produce suffering. There has to be some kind of cutting through habitual tendencies, which we've somehow or another gotten wound up in, whether it's due to rebirth, whether it's due to socialization, it doesn't matter. But unless we've really put some time and effort into a lot of spiritual discipline, we are wound up in conventional patterns. And those conventional patterns don't usually turn out to be happy, to have happy results. The second truth of Buddhism is that what produces all the unhappiness is the clinging, or the way it's sometimes put very simply, 
just wanting things to be different than they are. Wanting things to be different than they are is pretty unpleasant. And yet, how much of the time do we say, I wish it were different? I wish my life were different. I don't want it to be the way it is this moment. That's actually one of the experiences that can be very, very uh, transformative when you realize, oh, the reason I'm so miserable is that I want what I can't have. What's the solution? Stop wanting what I'm not going to have anyway, because wanting it isn't going to make it happen. So that brings us to a bit of Buddhism's third noble truth, which is um, that things can get a lot better, that we aren't condemned to always run around in circles, clinging to our habituated patterns. We can break free of them. <coughs> now, how Buddhism can be evaluated as a pessimistic religion with this outlook is a puzzle to me. But it often is. So that's the third truth, that things can get better. How to do that? Very often, paradoxically, the advice is, well, you have to relax. You have to learn to let be. You have to learn to let things be as they are, which doesn't mean accepting oppression at all but it also means knowing how to work against oppression without making oneself and others so miserable. Because often the people who are working the hardest to end oppression in that very process are making themselves miserable and they're making others miserable. It doesn't have to be that way. There can be a way to be very clear and detached and in being clear and detached, much, much more effective in actually changing things. So at this point, I'm going to start working more from a manuscript on how clinging to gender subverts enlightenment, and I will dip in and out of it, make extra comments, skip some parts, etc. Uh, to begin with the point we've been making, all forms of Buddhism adhere to teachings of egolessness, asserting that there is no permanent abiding self beneath the flux of experience despite our deep-seated emotional reaction, that there must be such a thing because it feels so real. That's where we start. It feels real, so we assume it must be there. Buddhist teachings also claim that much of our suffering is caused by our grasping to that non-existent but very deceptive self. Enlightenment, peace, unbinding, Whatever words one uses to convey the whole point of Buddhist view and practice require that one lay down the burden of constantly trying to constitute a self, an enduring and reliable identity, out of the kaleidoscope of our experience. Thus, it seems that the Buddha intended us to take this business of egolessness with utmost seriousness. One should wonder, then, why Buddhists have been so shy about questioning the overbearing importance gender plays in Buddhist institutional life. No other element of experience has such a stranglehold on our immediate reactions to people we meet, thus conditioning how we view them and making it impossible for us to simply encounter them freshly, free of preconceptions and prejudice. It's a really important point that when we meet people, instead of meeting them in a very fresh way, unless we are well-trained, we let a whole flood of preconceptions overwhelm, and we project that flood of preconceptions onto the person we're meeting, when our flood of preconceptions may have absolutely nothing to do with who that person is, what their dreams and hopes are. That's what happens with the prison of gender roles. This is also, this kind of thing has also deeply infected Buddhist institutional life historically uh, to a very great extent, and I would contend also even in Western Buddhism. Western Buddhism is much less free of institutional patriarchy than our historical Asian forms of Buddhism. But nevertheless, uh, there's still a lot going on in Western Buddhism as well. 
uh, including the fact that many of the most popular teachers are men. Uh, there are many more women teachers in Western Buddhism than there were are in traditional Asian Buddhism, but there's still by no means a parity. And because of the importance of the teacher role in Buddhism, I, I've always claimed that the mark of being free of the prison of gender roles in Buddhism is when about equal numbers of teachers are men and equal numbers are women. There is no role more important in non-theistic Buddhism than that of the Dharma teacher. Oh, there's, you know, nobody else that we can look to for guidance. Buddhists, at least reasonably well-educated Buddhists, all affirm egolessness and claim to believe that it actually describes how things are, even if they don't really understand egolessness and can't explain it. It is very, very common among Buddhists that they believe in egolessness, but they can't explain it. They just haven't spent the time in deep contemplation. What do these words mean? And in Buddhism, there's a distinction between words and meaning. It's fine to know the words. That'll get you through the test, but it won't get you through life. To get through life, you have to know what the words mean. And that's very, very important. Despite the fact that most Buddhists believe in egolessness, they also expect men and women to be different and to have different life plans and expectations. I can't tell you how many times exasperated Buddhists have said to me, but Rita, women and men are different. You have to accept that. Uh, you, this feminist critique of yours, you have to accept that men and women are different, period. Um, they are, <clears throat> many Buddhists are uninterested in and even hostile to Buddhist feminist reforms, such as lineage chants that include female ancestors. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, gender inclusive and gender neutral liturgies, or specific attention to female role models. Those are all issues I've worked on a lot within Buddhist institutions too. You wouldn't think that in the 21st century in North America, having gender neutral and gender inclusive liturgies would be a problem in you know, a sort of uh, fringe religion like Buddhism, but it still is. And female role models, that's a huge problem in Buddhism. In other words, their allegiance to teaching on, teachings on egolessness has had no impact on their reliance on conventional, everyday gender norms and stereotypes. For years, I have summarized this, I've used the slogan to summarize this situation. Though there is no permanent abiding self or ego, nevertheless, gender is real. <laughs> Put even more succinctly, egolessness is gendered, a statement that makes no sense, but a statement that captures the absurdity of clinging to rigid and fixed gender norms while also affirming egolessness. It seems to me that only one element of this motto can actually be adhered to, because its two elements are mutually exclusive. Which is more important to us, egolessness and enlightenment, or the security of conventional notions about gender? The tragedy is that Buddhists have spent a great deal of time and energy deconstructing ego with many sophisticated teachings. One would think that in working so hard to deconstruct ego, Buddhists would have noticed how central a component of ego gender is. Instead, they have spent a comparable amount of time and energy making and enforcing rules about gender, especially for monastics, and have also acquiesced without comment to the gender norms of the surrounding cultures. That's been one of the biggest problems in Buddhism. But they usually have not put these two enterprises together. They have not questioned why rules and norms about gender should be so important if nothing about the phenomenal self truly exists. Now here, I think I need to pause for a moment again. I've used this phrase, truly exists. Uh, in Buddhism, there is a very important distinction between apparent existence, which is never questioned because appearances appear, and true existence which would mean 
that things have essence, that they have an unchanging, uncaused, permanent core. And Buddhist, Buddhism denies that because it says when you look for it, you can't find it. You can't find it in yourself. You can't find it in phenomena. So we don't quarrel with appearances. There is the appearance. There are men, there are women, there are people of all sorts of shades in between, all sorts of ways of putting those together. But there's no essence there. There's no permanent abiding entity in any of that. So um, they have not questioned why rules and norms about gender should be so important if nothing in the phenomenal self truly exists rather than appearing to exist. Instead, the commonly invoked statement about gender is the slogan that enlightened mind is neither male nor female. That statement, that slogan, if you've been around a Buddhist gathering at all, where someone like me brings up the topic of uh, male dominance, somebody will perk up quite quickly and say, but enlightenment is neither male nor female beyond gender. Right away, they'll say that. As if that truism, because in terms of basic Buddhist teachings, that is correct teaching, as if that truism by itself undid all the pain and injustice caused by gender norms and stereotypes. All you have to do is bring out that slogan for quite a few years now. I've been telling teachers, don't, don't do that. Don't give such a glib, absolute truth answer to solve relative issues and problems that need to be worked on. To ensure that enlightenment is not subverted by clinging to gender, we need to bring these two sets of discourse together to analyze their relevance to each other. In the first instance, what is needed is not citation of the absolute, that enlightened mind is beyond gender, but much more discussion at the relative level, many more critical analyses of the relevance and utility of con conventional gender norms and practice. For though enlightened mind is beyond male and female, unenlightened minds are decidedly not con beyond concern with male and female. I have found in my many years of talking and writing about Buddhism and gender that Buddhists really dislike talking and thinking about gender at this level. Perhaps because apart from its uplifted slogan that enlightened mind is beyond gender, Buddhism's actual record on the practicalities of gender is quite depressing. Most will do almost anything to avoid that discussion on the practicalities of gender, even shaming and ridiculing those who want to have the discussion. The basic problem with conventional approaches to gender is that the immediate, often unavoidable perception that someone is either a man or a woman instantaneously brings with it a whole host of assumptions, expectations, and restrictions. So I've talked about some already. There is obviously no problem with the immediate perception. Gender designations as conventional agreed upon labels are harmless and somewhat useful. That, you know, we have to name things. We have to work with conventional language. That's the only way we can talk to one another. The problem lies with all the baggage imposed on that perception by long-standing training in conventional gender stereotypes. For example, thinking about my own experience, I know that I have a female body, and in my full-figured case, that is quite obvious to others as well. But that doesn't really give people much reliable information about me and no information that conforms me to the stereotypical female gender role. It does not mean that I must bear children or even that I can. It does not mean that I like children. It does not mean that I necessarily have a gentle, non-aggressive demeanor as opposed to a violent or nasty temperament. Lots of people think I'm nasty, especially when I used to grade papers. It does not even guarantee my primary sexual orientation, which has been guessed wrong almost as often as it has been guessed right, by
by observers, both men and women. My female sex is not a reliable guide to my interests and concerns. I care little for many of the things that are supposed to interest women, but I also am interested in some things that are generally thought to be of more interest to women than to men. In short, though my sex may be the first fact about me that registers, it tells people relatively little about me. Nevertheless, though my female body doesn't translate into anything essential, there's that word again, anything essential about me, a great deal has been projected onto it by society, by religions, and by individuals who think that the shape of my body reveals something intrinsically existing, something on which it is valid to pin all sorts of meanings and limitations. Some parts of my analysis of how clinging to gender subverts enlightenment actually have long been recognized by Buddhists. The easily misunderstood <clears throat> traditional teaching that female rebirth is less fortunate than male rebirth is precisely about the pain of being female in a male-dominated system, a point that is clearly recognized in traditional lists of the woes of female rebirth. It's one of the things I think is most interesting about traditional Buddhism. They've been very upfront about recognizing that in a male-dominated system, nobody would want to be born a woman. They've recognized that quite up front. The issue for people now, people like us, is that it seemed easier to turn women into men eventually than to change society, than to change the way gender worked in society. I think that's a point that we would disagree with that I certainly would. So much for ego grasping and gender as they pertain to the more mundane aspects of Buddhist institutions, lifestyles, and everyday life. What about some of the more profound Buddhist analytical and meditational techniques? The various deconstructive exercises of Buddhism were all designed to challenge students to try to find the insubstantial ego they took for granted, and not finding that self, discover peace and freedom. That's such an important sentence. I think I want to read some of it again. The deconstruct and Buddhism, the first disciplines in Buddhism are deconstructive. Things appear a certain way. Think about it more carefully, and you'll begin to see that those are big globs. And underneath those big globs, there's a lot of, of smaller stuff running around. So don't be fooled by the big glob. Ego is one of those big globs. A lot of analysis of how that works in Buddhism. The deconstructive exercises of Buddhism were all designed to challenge students to try to find the insubstantial ego they took for granted, and not finding that self discover peace and freedom. So this seems counterintuitive at first, that peace and freedom would come with not finding what you've been looking for. But when you finally concede it's not there, I'm never going to find it, that's a tremendous relief. And that brings peace and freedom. Uh, in the famous Mahamudra investigations as well, one explains whether mind can be found in any specific attribute, such as shape or color. Sometimes mind is used as a, as a term for self or ego. You think, you, you know, it, does your mind have a color? It's a very famous Mahamudra. I guess I could borrow the Zen word koan. Very famous Mahamudra koan. What color is your mind? You sort of go, what color is my mind? <laughs> you know, what's, what's the shape of your mind? You kind of go, shape of my mind? I don't know. I can't find it. In the Pali Suttas, when the Buddha is asked about any specific element being isolated and analyzed, 
He often says, teaches students, recognize that this is not yours, not you. Don't identify with it. It's part of your experience, but it's a fleeting, ever-changing, evanescent part of your experience. Don't identify with it. Don't think that's you. Don't think you've found that self. I suggest that while I have never heard a teacher apply these techniques to deconstructing gender, they could easily be applied to that task, significantly strengthening the deconstruction of ego in the process. Um, I've worked through the Mahamudra investigations myself. I sometimes teach the Mahamudra investigations, which are these, what color is your mind? What shape is your mind? Is your mind inside your body or outside your body? Um, where is your mind? Uh, there's, no, there's no traditional exercise that says, does your mind have gender? But I, I really encourage people to look for that as well, even though it's not a traditional exercise. Because I think that asking, well, does your mind have a gender, uh, would really uh, help to the deconstruction of ego. Such analyses have the added virtue that gender would be deconstructed on genuinely Buddhist grounds, not just through methods familiar to Western secular feminism. This was a very important point for me in working through this topic in this paper, that um, a lot of people have said, well, that's just secular Western feminism you're planting on top of Buddhism. But now, after many, many years of really looking deeply into the Buddhist texts and the Buddhist practices, I can say that no, uh, there are genuinely Buddhist deconstructions of gender. It's just that the traditional texts haven't noticed that they're there. Uh, this is a genuinely Buddhist method of deconstructing gender to uh, do the same kind of investigative analysis of the self of gender as we do with the self of color, the self of shape. We can apply it to culture, we can apply it to, you know, to everything, to race. Um, so that, I think, is a very important point, that you don't need, and it's fine to use secular methods in Buddhism, but you don't need to rely on non-Buddhist methods to do a Buddhist deconstruction of gender. Buddhist Buddhist analyses break down things that are assumed to be truly existing in entities by showing that we can't find them no matter where we look. To demonstrate this, let us work, look, look, with, look at the skandhas, um, especially the first skanda of form, the classic analysis in the Pali texts that there is no permanent abiding ego, is to say when you start examining it, you find that it's made up of five strands or five components, the first of which is form. But form alone doesn't make a self. The form dies, where's the self? So form alone doesn't make a self. Um, so uh, let's work with the first skanda. According to Buddhist analysis, we think we have or are truly existing self, but upon examination that turns out not to be the case because the purported self actually consists of five insubstantial components or skandhas. Looking at the first skanda of form, we see that it likewise is not an entity, but a, com but a composite. It breaks down into the four great elements, which helps us recognize that having a form does not translate into being a self. Commonly, such analyses also point out that things we often think define the form, such as color or shape, cannot really be found and do not confer truly existing selfhood on the form. It is curious that traditional analyses using color or shape to break down our assumption of real selfhood never use the terms male or female in the same way. This omission allows people to easily believe in egolessness while clinging to conventional gender norms and stereotypes. And that's the problem. You can easily believe in egolessness and still cling to conventional gender norms and stereotypes, which are rigid, arbitrary, inaccurate, and cruel. 
Would it not be just as useful to disclaim selfhood based on having a male or female form as it is to disclaim selfhood conferred by color or shape? Would it not be useful to contemplate gender as a composite made out of biology, cultural expectations, and habitual patterns rather than anything that exists truly or, in, or substantially? just as it is useful to demonstrate that every other thing that seems to be an identity can be broken into its component parts. I suspect that many Buddhists, while willing to do analyses that recognize that form does not confer selfhood, might balk at applying the same rigorous analyses to their male or female forms because gender seems so real to them. But doing so intensifies the deconstructive power of the analysis, making egolessness much less a theoretical belief and much more an in-your-face reality. Without that additional step, people can easily do the traditional exercises and genuinely believe in egolessness, but still be quite attached to gender. The effectiveness of such deconstructive analysis can be demonstrated by the reaction of a sweet young man after a day of my teaching on Buddhism and gender. He said, quote, without my mustache and genitals, I'd have no idea of who I was. <laughs> I wanted to shout, bingo, you've got it. <laughs> Consistently going to that place of not knowing who one is would go far to attain the peace of egolessness and freedom from the prison of gender roles. I think I have enough time here. I have a few examples I like to um, talk about it, maybe this point in the talk. Um, I, in one of my other papers, I've talked about the fact that it seems to me in our present situation, women have gone a lot further than men in being free of the prison of gender roles, as is evidenced by the fact that, well, many things, um, one of the latest is that women can now serve in combat roles in, in, mili in the military. If there's anything that we always thought was a male role, it's serving in combat in the army. But women are taking it on, and it's officially US policy. What's the equivalent of where men have taken on the female gender role, taken on things associated with the female gender role, with the same kind of um, consequences and the same kind of seriousness. Men won't even wear skirts. Whereas women wear skirts or pants easily depending on the temperature and the activity. Uh, I, I've teased many, many men about this and they become so uncomfortable so fast. You have to wonder what's going on. Why this fear of a mark, a real mark of femininity? Why are men so afraid of the thought that they might wear skirts? This morning I was watching um, all, the, all the men in Rome with the new pope being selected, you know, and all those dudes were wearing skirts. <laughs> and they're, you know, <laughs> so um, I think I find it very strange uh, one of my colleagues is a senior teacher in the Sangha I'm in, a man. I regularly bring this topic up because our teacher wants us to be in some kind of robes. And robes in the Tibetan tradition involve skirts for both men and women. Tibetan monks all wear skirts, as do monks in many traditions. And he just, it, she can't get anywhere because the men are so resistant to the possibility of wearing a skirt. And he said to me, he said to me the last time I brought this up, he said, Rita, you will never get us to give up our pants. Never. And I said, if you can't give up your pants, how are you ever going to give up your ego? <laughs> to which he kind of shook his head regretfully and said, I guess you've got a point. Consistently going to that place of not knowing who one is would go far to attain the peace of egolessness and freedom from the prison of gender roles. 
But if we all believe that enlightened mind, the natural state of mind is beyond gender, why is it important to so rigorously deconstruct gender? When teachers scold students who bring up gender issues by citing that enlightenment is beyond gender, or when Buddhists frustrated with a feminist critique of conventional gender practices also rely on this slogan, they are missing an important point. People cannot go to the state of mind beyond gender on the spot any more than they can just drop self-grasping the first time they hear teachings about egolessness. That transformation takes a great deal of time and effort, and tr just as training is necessary for people to actually approach egolessness, so training is required to transcend the prison of gender roles. Neither just happens. Additionally, a large percentage of self-grasping is not just ego-grasping. It is grasping to an ego that is deeply conditioned by its residence in a male body or a female body. And for many people, that maleness or femaleness of that body takes precedence over its humanity. It is important to grab people where they really live, which for many is not in their form skanda anyway. They live intimately with and identify very closely with their gender assignments. Until these attachments are cut, there will be ego clinging, no matter how much people may believe in egolessness. Giving absolute answers to questions about the relative is very unskillful in the short run, even if such answers are true in the long run. But to live in the relative world, we need our gender references. Some may protest, some may scream. To live day to day in the relative world, we have to have our gender references. They would claim a well-ordered society requires appropriate sex-specific behavior for men and women. <clears throat> now, even if that argument were true, and I don't think it is, it cannot be translated into an argument that male dominant gender relationships are good and just. Beyond that, the main problem with current gender arrangements is the rigidity and fixation with which people cling to them, a rigidity and fixation that is incompatible with relaxing into the state of mind beyond gender. To negotiate the relative gendered world in an ethical and ordered way, we only really need one thing. We need a humane, kind sex ethic, not numerous gender norms and stereotypes telling us how men should be and what women cannot do. The foundations of that sex ethic are already well in place in Buddhism. If one does not make an ego out of gender, one would still know whether one is a man or a woman gay, straight, bisexual, transgender, whatever else we may think of. But these identities need to be fit very loosely and be very lightly worn. All sense of privilege or deprivation, privilege or deprivation, equally important. You can make, you can do ego identification out of either privilege or deprivation. Um, equally easily. Believe me, I know about that. Um, all sense of privilege or deprivation that has developed around one's gender identity, all rigidity regarding proper roles and behaviors for the various genders must be cut through. We really do need to stop making an ego out of gender. And that may well be more difficult than learning about skandhas and other traditional Buddhist deconstructive analyses. Gender may well be the last component of our conditioned, composite, impermanent, ever-changing ego to lose its grip on us. That is how clinging to gender subverts enlightenment. Given the dire consequences of our clinging to gender, it really is a tragedy that for so long, Buddhists have been blind to how this attachment subverts enlightenment and so unwilling to take seriously the analysis that clinging to gender really is an obstacle to resting in the peacefulness and spaciousness mm -hmm. of enlightened mind. Thank you.
Thank you, Rita, um, very much. Uh, she's going to be um, a answering questions for about half an hour or so. Uh, so Most given my voice. Yeah, yeah. W you can give me a sign when you want the last question to be asked. Um, I do want to make two quick announcements. Uh, one is that there are some books that are for sale outside uh, if you wish to buy them. And secondly, if you're interested in, in meditation, if the talk has kind of inspired you, there is a meditation group on campus and you can always contact me and I'll let you know about that. Um, what I'm going to do is try to uh, run over to whoever wants to ask a question and give you the microphone. If you want, if you know you're going to ask a question, you could also kind of gather over here to make it a little bit easier. Um, but why don't we get started by having somebody raise their hand if they want to ask a question. Oh, go over here. And then you hold it close to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I was thinking about something that you said when you, and when I came back, you were saying, and that's what allows people to, in, you know, express that conflict that they believe in egolessness and yet they cling to gender. Can you tell, talk a little more about what it is that allows people to do that? I mean, I missed a few words just there. Um, could, well, you said something about, in your analysis, you said, and that's what allows people to believe in egolessness but still cling to gender rules. Um, and I missed it because I was thinking about something else you had said. I see. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about a little more about, um, really more about how that happens in our I think it happens because habits are very deep. Habits are very, very deep and very hard to break. And um, nowadays, even before we're born, we are identified as boy or girl. And everybody puts huge freight on that identification. And very few people um, do anything to cut the importance of all the freight that gets put on that identification. Um, certainly, you know, there's less expectation today probably than I was being brought up because when I was being brought up, it was just so rigid. Um, the habits are very hard to break. And, you know, good Buddhists like good everybody else want to, they want to get the religion they think they believe in and they memorize as much as they can, and they learn how to repeat the right formulae, but it doesn't sink in. People haven't done enough contemplative work, which is so important in Buddhism that it's fairly easy to learn the teachings, sort of fairly easy, to penetrate what do they mean? How does this change my life? That takes a lot more. And so because gender is something that people rarely question its centrality or whether it's really there, people rarely question that. They can believe in egolessness at the same time as they enforce gender roles on themselves and everybody around them. They don't see the contradiction. Partly because nobody's, nobody's even suggested you know, there really is a contradiction between your belief in egolessness and the way you cling to conventional gender norms. It looks like you. Okay. Back there. Want to come out so that it's... No. Hi. Um, I have a question about putting this into practice and what are three or, you know, four or five if you want, ways that we as just normal people can develop a greater awareness of this in our day-to-day -day life and three things to watch out for and really turn our eye to. That's a great question, and I'm not sure I can answer it all that well uh, on the spot because I know it's very hard for, it, our, for guys in our culture to suddenly start wearing skirts. <laughs> When I uh, was at Tassajara, which is a Zen center in, in, in California in a very dry, hot climate, um, they have a hot springs resort there in the summer which serves gourmet vegetarian food. And they don't have electricity, so everything has to be done by hand. 
And the guys, the college students, would work there in the summer to earn credits to do practice periods in the winter because to, to pay for them with money is fairly expensive, but with work, they could do it. I came out there, I gave some version of this talk about guys wearing skirts, and these men were so proud of themselves because they had figured out that in the hot conditions they were working in, skirts were a lot more practical. And they were, they were so proud of themselves because they were fearless. Um, but I think the most important thing is to really look into one's own habits and ask how much of my habits are conditioned by gender norms and expectations and how uncomfortable would it make me to do something a little different. I think how uncomfortable it would make me to imagine that I might do something conventionally associated with a different gender. That that's a very good exercise. I think a very good exercise, it's hard to do because it's hard to find the circumstances, is to seek out situations where we're with people whose gender markers are very blurred and we're not sure whether we're dealing with a man or a woman. That's a very instructive situation. It's hard to find, but watch your own mind and ask how comfortable am I in a situation where I don't know for sure if I'm dealing with a man or a woman. How much of my behavior is conditioned on my knowledge that this is a man or a woman. I once was in a situation, a good place where you can have that is corresponding with people in a different culture where you don't know the gender that goes with personal names. You know, you don't know. Here we know, John, oh, that's gonna be a guy. Jane, that's gonna be a girl. But I once was um, invited to a conference in Finland where the person organizing the conference, I corresponded with this person for a year and I didn't know whether I was corresponding with a man or a woman. It was very, very interesting. And it turned out even though it was a conference on gender, uh, I had been corresponding with a man, uh, but I didn't know for sure. So any situation where you can be less clear about who you're dealing with and watch your own mind uh, kind of panic and look for a marker, that's a very good one. Um, I'll stop there for now and try to think of more. I think that's, I mean, the one that comes to my mind so clearly is skirts because I've seen men just get so freaked out about it. Um, and, you know, it's hard in a way because in so many instances, women have, you know, women are so much more comfortable transgressing conventional gender roles, which I think perhaps indicates a lingering sexism in our society that we don't even want to admit is there. It's, uh, you know, it, well, anyway, I'm going to stop there for now. Hey. Where are you? Um, so, oh, th thank you very much for your s lecture. It was very enlightening. Um, so my question: you're, you're talking about the um, you're talking about the ways in which women are not included yet within Buddhist communities, Tibetan Buddhist, Zen, traditional Thai. Uh, there's there's many different kinds of Buddhism, but um, and, and I'm just wondering something. I'm, I mean, I'm wondering the monasteries were almost always male, and I don't understand why. Honestly, I don't mm -hmm. understand. I mean, I understand the cultures that mm -hmm. East Asia like created that reinforced like notions of patriarchy and how patriarchy benefits those cultures in the same way that it did in Western European cultures but I still don't really understand exactly why monasteries were <laughs> male. But, but what I'm wondering is, on a historical arc, American Buddhists 
were coming mostly from patriarchal cultures too. I mean, they were coming from Judaism, they were coming from Christianity, and it's like, it's only now it's like feminism is kind of bringing women into Buddhism. I mean, in the Sangha that I've practiced at, there are women and men leading the Sangha, and it's, it's positive, but it's like, it's almost like history has its own kind of unconditioning that it does, in addition mm -hmm. to the individual as a discrete element, but not discrete. History is an element which is discrete, but not discrete also. Does it, I'm just kind of wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, uh, I think there are two questions there. One is about monasticism in Buddhism. And I could give a whole talk longer than the one I just gave on the ins and outs of monasticism in Buddhism. But the short answer is that there are female monastics in Buddhism. Um, there have been from the beginning of Buddhism. Uh, they've never been as, historically, they've never been as well supported as male monastics. Um, for reasons I can, it could explain, but it would take a while. And as, as a result, in some Buddhist cultures, female monasticism died out, but not in East Asian Buddhism. Oh, the full ordination lineages have survived in Korean, Chinese, um, and to some extent Vietnamese uh, forms of Buddhism. And there are very, very strong movements to revive it in the Tibetan or the Theravada forms of Buddhism where it either died out or never existed. Um, as I said, for the most part, female monastics were not as well supported as male monastics, just part of the reason why they lost out. But today, especially in Taiwan, it's very interesting there, and Korea, um, I'm pretty sure in Korea, and to some extent in Tibet as well, many more women are entering monastic life than men. Partly that has to do with the fact that men have a lot of opportunities in the secular economy that women don't have, and part of it has to do with the fact that a lot of women would prefer uh, to have, live a somewhat more independent life in which they can receive some education than to enter into a, a very male-dominated marriage. And Asian women will talk about that quite freely if you get to know them. Um, in Western Buddhism, monasticism is um, pretty limited because there isn't the economic basis for it. There just isn't a class of wealthy donors who will support other people to practice. Those who are interested in Buddhist practice have enough trouble finding the time and money themselves, as you know if you're a practicing Buddhist. And I think in many ways that, that is to the benefit of Western Buddhism because there can be a lot of problems that arise in Buddhist societies when there's too much reliance on monastics as the only carriers of the tradition. That's another whole paper that I can't go into tonight. Um, I think what's perhaps karmically interesting is that Buddhist teachers from Asia started arriving in the West in large numbers in the late 60s and into the 70s, which was the same time when the second wave of feminism was um, really taking off. And that's why the situation of women in Western Buddhism is so much different from what it's been in Asian Buddhism. Um, I really do think that there was what I've termed an auspicious coincidence of Buddhism and feminism that occurred in the West that um, made the situation quite different for us. And I think that's, um, that there's something very important about looking at that and really working with the situation. Um, many people have hypothesized that in frontier situations or new situations, women and men uh, can easily attain more equality than they do in really established situations. Uh, this has happened in many cases. And as situations become more established and routinized, there tends to be a reversion to male dominance which I think is something Western Buddhists need to watch out for and look out for. Um, 
and something that I think we need to be sensitive to. But, you know, a lot has changed in the last 60 years or so for women and therefore for men as well, because if things change for one, gender, one sex, they're going to change for the other sex as well. Women and men are obviously completely interdependent with one another, and you can't have major changes in women's lives without it affecting men's lives or men's lives without it affecting women's lives. So um, we'll see what happens in the next 50 or 60 years. I obviously won't be around by the end of that time, but it'll be interesting anyway. Rita, if I could just ask one quick question to follow up. How would you characterize the, the situation of gender, kind of sexual desire in Buddhism? A, a lot of Buddhist communities have been roiled by sexual scandals. Yeah. I was wondering if you could at least reflect as somebody who's been um, you know, a practitioner for many decades, where you see the current state being around those issues. You know, I'm, I, um, I try to stay out of discussions of the sexual scandals in Buddhism as much as I can. Um, because people are so opinionated about them. People have very, very strong, heavy opinions. Um, you know, I don't know what went on. I don't know if um, this kind of behavior in the part of male students and or male teachers and female students was common in Asian Buddhism or not. I have read some stories, read some sources. In some cases, maybe yes. Or did they think that, like so many, you know, there's so much cross-cultural confusion about sexuality between Asian countries and Western countries. There's just so much cross-cultural confusion that, uh, you know, people think Western women are sexually available to everyone, which is clearly not the case. But there are things about Western culture, especially popular culture, that can give that impression to people, including men from other cultures, and they just think, maybe they think it's the norm. As for sexual desire in Buddhism altogether, um, that's, you know, would be another whole paper. In early Buddhism, the reason for avoiding sexuality is not because sexuality is um, negative or evil or degraded or any of those things, but because if you were sexually active, you also had children. And if you had children, it was very hard to pursue a full-time spiritual practice, therefore avoid sex so that you don't have domestic responsibilities. There was a very strong sense in early Buddhism of the impossibility of having a very deep spiritual life at the same time as you were totally embroiled in career, livelihood, family issues. Throughout Buddhist history, that dichotomy has softened a lot. Um, as you see, the whole history of Buddhism is less and less emphasis that you have to be a celibate monastic to be a serious Buddhist practitioner. And um, in some more recent forms of Buddhism, almost the opposite is said. So. Uh, the issue of sexual desire or sexuality in Buddhism, I think, is a very different issue from the sexual indiscretions of Buddhist teachers. And, um, you know, in, there are lots of, lots of steps these days to try to curtail the sexual indiscretions of Buddhist teachers. Most practice centers now require you to sign on to a code of ethics. I mean, I've been required to sign a code of ethics to do a to our workshop, you know, that I wasn't going to uh, be sexually improper with anybody during my two hour workshop, which I thought was a little bit extreme. But uh, obviously, this, it's a very tangled issue. And it's a very sad issue because it's hurt a lot of people. It's also hurt a lot of very good teachers who, for one reason or another, just can't seem to observe boundaries, observe proper boundaries in the teacher-student relationship. You know, and I, it's too bad for everybody because um, the good teachers lose their teaching position, the students feel betrayed, 
uh, many, so many of them leave Buddhism. It's very, you know, just a very sad situation. Questions would you be willing to answer? Uh, t maybe two more. I two see more? Two, I see two okay. hands. We'll go here and then there. So There's a hand down here that I saw. We'll see how long they are. Okay. Hi. Um, so I, I have a question um, sort of about, uh, it, at the beginning of your talk, you, you mentioned how it, for a more, I don't want to say secular, but less Buddhist-affiliated crowd, we might equate egolessness with identity. Um, and I feel like, uh, in feminist politics and feminist theory, especially in the more recent um, bout of work, um, identity politics are one of the defining aspects of it. And mm -hmm. in our feminist theory course that we have here, we read a book called um, Queer Phenomenology, which is about the process of becoming um, and how we can sort of look at identity as a process. Um, and I was wondering, um, sort of, uh, it's something I've been grappling with personally um, about how do how do we sort of combine this sense of becoming and um, identity and flux mm -hmm. um, into our politics of identity. Um, and I was, uh, I guess, my question for you is, um, how would you take sort of um, your Buddhist viewpoint and apply it to feminist identity politics and maybe if you have feminist any thoughts. Feminist what? Identity politics. Okay. So, um, thank you. Well, I think in, uh, in the book I'm writing right now, which is on Buddhism and religious diversity, um, I did a chapter that was, had a, something in the title like hyphenated identities. Um, I just, I just think that putting too much freight onto any one specific identity uh, is problematic from both a Buddhist point of view and a mental health point of view. Uh, I think it's very easy to become too identified with any one specific identity. I put too much freight on it and it doesn't work in the long run. In the long run, it breaks down somehow. So identity, as I said in the last page of my comments here, um, these identities need to fit very loosely and be worn very lightly. Of course we have a sense of identity. I know I'm this and not that. The question is how much freight do I put on it? How much do I expect it to save me? Which it won't. How much am I willing to use it as a kind of way to differentiate myself from others? Um, you know, I, I think that ideology, even the correct ideology, is often something that produces a lot of suffering. I think it's much harder to know how to apply one's insight in compassionate and helpful ways than it is to have good insights. Or, you know, another way to say this is it's fairly easy to look at, a, at an ethical situation and see what's the, what's the more compassionate thing to do. How to do that skillfully in ways that don't create more divisions and hard feelings then they heal. That's very, very hard. Um, you know, and I think you only need to look at the way in which people get so polarized. Both sides have good intentions and are well-meaning, and people get so polarized, and enmity develops when people cannot get past their ideologies and start to talk to each other and meet with each other again, as pre-ideological human beings. So, yes, it's important. Uh, consciousness raising was certainly an important part, is an important part of the feminist journey, but I don't think it's the end or the goal of the feminist journey. Wearing our identities loosely, being willing to let ourselves grow and change very important. I remember how scary it was to me 
when I first started to lose all of my feminist rage under the influence of meditation, I felt like, oh my God, what's happening to me? Who will I be if I'm not angry about sexism? You know, I mean, I had a pretty well-developed identity about having been really wronged. And, you know, when I felt that way, I couldn't talk to people in a way that helped them at all. They just turned me off. We always turn off people who are too ideological in the way they approach us. We can't listen to people who are self-righteous. You just can't listen to them. So being too self-righteous, too ideological, makes us ineffective spokespeople for what we care about most deeply, which is really sad, but it's true. I guess one more question. This is related to what you were just talking about, but in your discussion about the third noble truth, you talked about how it's important to accept things as they are, but mm -hmm. then that doesn't mean you have to accept oppression. Right. I was wondering if you could offer more about that shift. Yeah, people sometimes say, we have to accept things as they are, and that means accepting injustice. Um, but that's not really what things as they are, is the natural state of mind of Buddha nature. Things as they are is not uh, injustice and um, oppression. That's a flawed state, not things as they are. And that's, I think, pretty clear in Buddhist teachings. But a lot of people really easily want to say, well, things as they are includes sexism and male dominance, because it makes things easy for people on top. But I don't think it's accurate dharma at all. Um, I think the trick, though, as I said, is to not is to work with oppression or work against oppression, however way you want to put it, in such a way that we don't make ourselves and others more miserable in the process. Because lots of times people really make themselves and others miserable fighting for good causes. It's very easy to see that happening all the time. You had your hand up, so you get the last question. My question was what the last two people asked about how do you be, how do you well, bring your spiritual wisdom into the activist world of trying to change the spiritual tradition you're part of. So we're all on the same wavelength, yeah. sisters. There's, a, there's an article in, I think they have my book, Garland of Feminist Reflections, out there. There's an article, on, it's called in this book, The Clarity and the Anger. It's something I've written and written and written about because um, you know, anger contains a great deal of clarity, but you have to unlock the clarity and be able to express the clarity and let the anger settle out. It's very difficult to do, but it's really, really important. And that's the lesson I learned more than anything else I've ever learned from Buddhism. That's the lesson I learned, and I'm very, very grateful for that lesson because otherwise I don't think I ever could have done anything effective in my work as a Buddhist feminist. So that's a good note to end on. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Don't forget there are books uh, out that direction that could be purchased. And uh, I really appreciate you coming and thank you Rita very much.